Okay. Yeah. Um, we can start by talking about what you do now, mm. like you know, career-wise, work-wise. Right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You don't have to look at her and just look at me. All oh, right. Okay, so right now I just moved to Berlin not, um, a year or two ago. Uh, and in Berlin, I'm a full time student. About a friend and I started a small gallery in London last year. So once a month or, or twice a month, I fly back to London and put on exhibitions. I don't know how to call myself. So, like when people ask, so. What are you? I don't feel like a gallerist, but I'm also not feeling like a curator. So oh, you were doing events before. Right? I was for three, four years, but I need to call it an end. Like the amount of socializing was just I couldn't live up to it, and my body didn't like it. I think towards the end, like by the end of third year, it was very like there were times that I just couldn't get up from the sofa. Like my back has serious problem, and at one point was, yeah, I had some bad tissues like in my body. So I think at the end I really had to call it an end because I had to go in for minor surgery. So I was like, right, something needs to change, and yeah, so I need to like, I decided to move to Berlin because I thought I needed a break, and uh, I thought about being a writer for a while. So I try to write short stories for you. Um, but yeah, I think writing takes time. It's not like you want to be a writer and then bam, you are a writer. So I still write short stories. But now, yeah, I go to London to run my little art space. And in the beginning, when you went into painting, did you have to convince your parents to let you do it? <gasps> Let you do whatever you want. It's so cool that you asked it. Like they were giving me all the freedom that so much I sometimes didn't know how to handle myself. But my parents were really they are like quite classic like seventies parents. Like, you know, back then in Taiwan if you have a business, small business is going to make money, it's going to grow because it's when the economy become free and took off. So I didn't grow up with my parents, like I grew up with my grandma, like my grandparents. So I think I was like really free, but it's a sort of freedom that is, it's kind of a, a bit of a neglected child really. It's a freedom that you didn't ask for and you didn't know where the boundary is kind of. And when I was 14, I moved to England and was like busy adapting, integrating into the society. And when I was applying for art school, before I even moved to England, I always thought I wanted to do art. But when the time got closer, before I applied for like art degree in London, uh, my dad was visiting in London. And I took him to Chelsea to have a look, to show him that that's where I'm gonna study. And, and then I asked him, are you really okay that I'm doing fine art? Like fine art. I didn't even know what it means doing fine art at the time. But I just knew that this is what I have worked I've been working towards to like all my teenage hood. And then he said to me, because he's like a businessman, like a hardcore businessman, um, worked almost all his life in Hong Kong. And then he said that um, I have the full support, but he needs to let me know that if I choose this path, I need to take full responsibility for whatever lifestyle I'm gonna end up having. Basically he's trying to say that if this education is bringing you any limitations, it's beyond their understanding or beyond, like they can't help. Mm. So it's, it's on me. Um, it was a nice little chat, but like later in my life when I was like second year in Chelsea or even like when I went back to Taiwan, I thought about that and I was like, oh wow, yeah. Um, it's quite impressive because he has never lived in English-speaking countries, he's never lived in the West, he's never got into art. Like, I saw the advice that he gave was quite, if anything, quite insightful. Do you talk to him about what you do now and do they understand why you are not doing art anymore? Even though you're yeah, 
I think I don't think my mom ever understood what does it mean to study art. I think she always think that is a hobby. I always think, I think she always thinks that it is for me to have the freedom to study abroad and choose whatever I wanted to study is more about their hard work rather than my future, if that make any sense. And me, I have an older brother and both of us like moved to the UK when we were 14. So it's not until much later when I'm a bit more of adults like when I think back I remember like when I'm home for summer and going to see family friends my mom had this proud you know attitude with her just oh yeah my daughter is studying England blah, blah, blah. but I don't think she ever even start to understand what we are studying but when I had to leave London and went back to Taiwan to live for a few years I was continuing um, doing events and mostly like nighttime events, but I don't obviously invite them to that. But um, I also were curating some exhibitions. She came to one of them and that one went quite well. And it was on um, 蘋果日報, like Apple Daily, you know, it was on like newspaper. It was like on the first page of Yahoo ever. So I was like showing her the newspaper. Still, she said like, oh, congratulations, but you know, still you need to get a job, like, you know, <laughs> to be part of the society. But not in a judgmental way, but in a, in a way like, oh, I'm happy that you're doing what you love, but you know, life goes on, like, so, yeah. I think it's for me, I have an older brother, and now I'm older, I start realizing the family from my dad's side is incredibly, incredibly traditional. And like, there's a little moment I remember that when my grandpa or grandma from my dad's side, when they visit us, I don't need to say hi. I'm just staying in the room. But my brother has to, like we were so young. I think I was like six or seven. Um, but my brother has to go and sit with them and talk with them. Like he is the grandson. Um, and then he get all this like pocket money and then like, you know, we talk to, but then it's fine if I stay in the room. I think for them, he is the grand, he's the, he's the grandson. He's like the, the, the son of their son. How do you say it? Like in Taiwan, I don't know if it's like that in China or Hong Kong still, because like in Taiwan, even a few young people that I've talked to, they still think like, um, I'm talking about in the countryside, um, they still think that um, daughter is to be married out of the family. And it's still there, which is really weird. Because when I was growing up in England, I heard about this on TV. I saw this on the internet. But when I went back and realizing up until I was 14, I was also growing up in that sort of structure. I was like, oh, wow, wow. And a lot of, um, a lot of little incidents now, like little things, like when I was a kid, Whenever I had a question about like, oh, how does this thing work? Or how does, how do you make a sticker? I remember this one for like very particular reason. So I was asking my dad, how does, how do you make a sticker? Um, and then he just turned to my brother saying like, oh, your little sister has a question. Now you have to solve it. It's really odd, no? But that is like the subtlety, like with a subtle little suggestion all the way, like how... I guess like it builds an environment where the woman or the younger sister is is to be taken care of, kind of. But then when I moved to England, like I was always by myself because like me and my brother didn't live together. So I think then it was a very real situation. I need to start develop who I am and how to survive. So when I then again went back to that kind of context, it became so clear like how, yeah, the, the whole structure is really weird. 
If anything, it's a bit funny, no? It's really weird. He's getting really old. And then he was like contacting my mom saying like, oh, if, um, um, if the, my brother has a long-term girlfriend and they are happy together, then I'll pay for the wedding and everything. Just get this mission done with. But that sort of conversation was like, it never happened. So it's like, hmm, okay. But then, good and bad, you know, because of that, I think I have a complete, seriously complete freedom to do whatever. It's not bad. <laughs> I know. So like very, like no expectations, but also on the downside of it is like you are not uh, you don't feel like someone is looking forward to seeing how you become um, anything goes kind of uh, but in no way I'm feeling negative about it I just feel like I'm really really lucky um, especially coming from like 70s Taiwanese family from the countryside in Taiwan. Like, I think I'm pretty, really lucky. They really don't... Also, maybe because they're really busy with work, even until now. Um, I think they also probably just don't really have the actual time to control or guide or influence me in any way. So, yeah. You never had that pressure to get married like, like your brother? My grandpa mentioned it, but it wasn't a pressure. Like how he put it is so funny. So like I was living in Taiwan for a few years. So I'll go home, like go to my dad's, my grandpa's house for, for dinner sometimes, like once or twice a year. And eventually I was turning 26, 27. So that was the time I just got back to Taiwan and doing all this event, exhibitions. I was like really pumped. Yeah, I want to see how far I can go. Um, and so he would ask me, like, oh, so what do you do in Taipei now? La, la, la. But he's not really trying to understand the answer. He's just trying to find a way to say that I think it would be better if you just find a good man to get married. Uh, he would say, like, um, say it as that is a better path to take on. And I used to laugh because it just never registered in my head. I'm just like, how is that better? Or how is that easier? Like, it's really hard to find a man <laughs> that you can get along with or it's feel like you can communicate with. It just doesn't make sense to me at the time when I freshly arrived in Taiwan. Like, how is that an easier way? Like, how, like just, it, it's practically not easier. But for them, it just... It was a good advice for them to give, I guess. But I was never pressurized into it. Would you say your parents both have equal say in how you grew up? Or no, no, definitely not. It almost feels like my mom kind of just woke up now. Like <laughs> two years ago, she's just like, oh, wait. Um, no, my, my dad is definitely the one who is deciding everything let's say if my dad is like the head my mom is the muscle like oh, my mom is this really really hard-working woman who can put up a lot she's really warm like really good with people um but she's a doer she doesn't sit down and think about things she's she's also not greedy She's not someone who is like, okay, now I have a good business. I'm going to branch out to China, to America. She's not like that at all. Whereas my dad is almost the opposite. So I think even before they got my brother, um, it was my dad telling her like, oh, let's start a business together. This is going to uh, kind of picturing a life, pitching a life to my mom. And I think my mom, my mom kind of just went with it. 30 years later, like, oh wait, ah, oh, everything is decided by him. This is one incident I was trying to mention. Uh, uh, what was it? You said she just woke up three years later. Ah, right. <laughs> yeah. And I think in between, I think when I was a kid, even when I just got to England, I was like oh, excited about new things. Uh, but then eventually when I turning like 16, 17, 18, there were a period of time that I felt like I was not being taken care of. Like I feel like I was only in England because they didn't have time. Like my mom didn't have time. And 
I didn't hate my life. I was really enjoying everything new that was happening in England. But there's, there's time that I wanted. I asked my mom to call me more, but she couldn't find the time. When the internet Skype became a thing, like I asked her to like install Skype and then like, you know, let's just Skype once a week or once every two weeks, but she could never find time. Um, so I always felt like, yeah, she just didn't have time for me. But I think one summer I went home and the manager that worked for my mom, we were chatting. And sometimes, you know, as a teenager, you kind of complain about things like sideways. So you don't complain to your mom, but you complain to the people around her. So telling her like, oh yeah, my mom sent me away because like she can't stand me at home. Um, but then the auntie, the manager worked for my mom. She said like, like she asked me like, have you seen your mom crying? I was like, why, why are you asking? And she says she, like, she, she has seen my mom crying and every time it's only because like, she misses us. And I was like, huh, because I really have not seen my mom cry or like I've seen her angry, but I've never seen her being like vulnerable or weak like in front of us. Um, and then when she told me that, like, I think I was in high school or something, and I was just thinking, let's, it didn't quite make sense. That means that I have to reinterpret a lot of things I've building up, like how I understood my life and my relationship with her. Um, yeah, and I think it was until then I tried to take a second look, like, oh, when she says she's busy, how busy is she actually is? I used to think that was just an excuse, that like she didn't have patience for kids, you know, kind of. But I still feel like quite neglected for a very long time. I think it's until I moved back to Taiwan when I had to leave London uh, when I was like 25, 26. Then we had more time to hang out a little bit because just because I'm around in Taiwan. Um, then I see how she lived her life which is really, really not fun. Like it really just like work um, because of my father's epic dream of building this business empire, you know? Um, and yeah, I was just wondering where did she find the motivation to um, realize someone else's dream? Um, yeah. I, I don't know how she finds the strength to do that. Like I remember like when I just got back, she said she has been having insomnia for like almost 20 years. Oh no, wait, sorry, almost 10 years. And so she goes to sleep every night by taking a lot of pills. Sleeping pill is like super dangerous. And I was like, oh, please, can you stop taking pills? I only found out because she had a minor car crash. Uh, back home like not, not nothing serious, but the car was ruined and then I found out about this and I was sending the recipe recipe is it recipe like the list of the sleeping pills like the name of the pills oh. Yeah, uh, prescription I was sending the prescription to my doctor friend and asked them like uh, any of those like like what are those pills really because she was taking I think four or five pills oh. every night to go to sleep I don't know what she was taking, but then anyway, some like my friend got back saying like, oh, some of those are quite heavy. And if you're taking them, you're not supposed to walk the stairs or um, live alone, never mind driving, you know? And I was just like, oh wow, like, I don't know what she went through all these years, like by herself. So I was asking her like, please, let's go to a doctor that used alternative therapy like like um no dian liao fa you know it's like you put like this little magnetic thing or like hematized therapy like i was just asking her like please can we try something different instead of pills um then we went to one of the clinic which is like an hour drive away from home so i was sitting in the consultation room with her and she was just like talking to the doctor uh about how she developed this insomnia and she talked about it with such lightness, but it was just like I remember halfway I had to leave the room and go out and take a coffee and I was just like Oh my god, because she has always lived alone from since I can remember and she was just saying that she used to When it 
when she first starts having like a lot of dreams that is making it very difficult for her to sleep she'll wake up and write down the dream and hoping that would help and then she was sharing some of the dreams and it was involving like she's walking on a narrow street and me and my brother fall into the water on both sides and she was trying to handle both of us you know stuff like that oh. <laughs> and she talked about it with such lightness just like ah oh, this is just what happened um so the doctor was tell asking her if she had tried anything else to help her sleep um she just said that i really she just said that she just doesn't have the time she just doesn't have time you know doesn't have time to even take care of her own sleeping oh it was such a shock for me i was it was so hard and I think since then, that was the first year when I went back. Like, I was just feeling so guilty about the freedom that I got to have. Um, and I used to, like, in the past, every summer when I went back, we would hang out for like three days or a week. But we always fight, you know, we don't get along. We never live together, so just like, ugh. Um, and I'll give her a lot of advice about how... Uh, making friends, go on holiday, dress better, put on makeup, you know, all this girl thing. Um, but I think, I think I was also encouraged her to have a social life or to think about herself more or like, you know, all this advice. But I think until then, when I went to the consultation with her, it hit me that I got to have the freedom to think about all this thing about myself because it was given to me i didn't have to struggle not struggle but i didn't have to be i didn't have to work the, so hard the way she has been all her life so your parents are in the same business but they yeah. live separately yeah i think they are mentally separate well romantically separated even before i was born when i was born like my dad was not there um but um they do they are in the same business uh but kind of like because my dad is the, the one who's always working in hong kong the headquarter in taiwan before was more like the manufacturing the how do you say it the branding the distribution um and china is the place where they source all the ingredient and you know um so my mom is taking care of taiwan basically and my dad is in hong kong mostly but she never did business before right so she kind of just jumped into it actually before she met my dad oh <laughs> it's funny how all in the old day how people um hook up like it's just like all oh, this story they don't really talk about it but it's just like so interesting so my mom her She's, she grew up in like a f farmer, in the farmland. So she was like selling chicken and stuff. And she ended up working a jazz piano bar restaurant as a waitress, waiter. Um, and then very soon she learned that the jazz piano singer, the jazz music player, uh, in the middle of the restaurant, like, you know, on the stage, she's making way more money than she does, uh, than she did. And she's told me that she just, like, self-taught piano after, like, the restaurant closed, just so that she can get more money. And I think within, I think within half a year or something, she started singing and playing piano as well. And my mom's side's family, like, also, it's very different to my, my dad's side. It's just very down-to-earth people. Um, and apparently all the sisters of my mom and my grandma from my mom, they all love singing. It's just something that they do. Um, so I think a few months in, she started playing and singing <clears throat> and then become the jazz singer for that restaurant. And as she told me, like, I think after a year, she made enough money to by the restaurant and she became the new owner of the restaurant so from what she said the restaurant was doing really well and then my dad showed up at that time and just basically went after her you know the singer on stage and then he was just like 
bringing guy friend to kind of, I don't know, pursue her. And he made it. <laughs> and, but very soon, I think after that, after they got together, he was asking my mom to sell the restaurant to start a business with him, like this business that they are running now. Um, so that's that. So she had some experience running her own business before, but it was when she was really young, uh, like early 20s. Like. Right, so she owned a restaurant? Mm, eventually oh. she did, but not for a very long time. I mean, so she gave you that capital basically for her business. Exactly. And yeah. how did her parents think about it? Because they, when it's not something that, you know, that they are so unconventional. Uh, but then again, in a countryside, in any island, I guess, it's just no law then, really. Um, so my mom had my brother before my grandparents from my mom were even accepting my dad into their house. Um, so they secretly went to like the regist registry office and like just signed the paper. So they became married, but no one knew. Um, and then eventually, because my dad was like, he's, a, also, he's also a really hardworking person and he's also if anything, <laughs> I'm quite similar. Like everyone in our family said that I'm a lot more similar to my dad than my mom. He's very sensitive and because of that, he's also able to consider a lot of factors. So I think after a while, he was like getting along with my mom's parents and then my grandparents believed that he's a very hardworking person. So they kind of just, okay, let them be. But at that time, they didn't know that. My mom is already pregnant and then they are already married on paper. Sorry, Baileyus. There's something weird. I feel like if my mom doesn't live well, I also shouldn't have what she doesn't have, you know? There's always this daughter's guilt. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to explain. Yeah, I think it's quite relatable though. Um, but yeah. But in a way, she sacrificed herself so you can have this freedom. Like, so. I know, but I. If you counter, if you counter it with guilt, then it's like undoing her. Hard but, work. Yeah. I know, but sometimes I have never been a mother, so I don't know. But sometimes, when I think about why I can't just hang out with her. I don't know, be in the same house with her or just be around so she feel a bit more secure. I can't even give time to her. Like, I don't know, it just feels really oh, guilty, yeah. But, but then I think a lot of people who left home probably just have to deal with that, like, all the time. Um, but yeah, it's our choice you choose to be in, in like another foreign country after? It's really complex. But I think one main reason for me to come to Germany is that I was so keen on picking up another language. And I think when I was in Taiwan, I witnessed how domineering the English language is. It's pretty annoying. Like it's really, it made me really uncomfortable. Um, when I was in Taiwan, like I think seeing all this foreign culture and foreigners in Taiwan and uh, not communicate, but talk at Taiwanese culture, talk at the local people. There's no communication. It was very domineering. And I think, I think, yeah, I became very interested in seeing, maybe try to understand the world with another language on top of like Mandarin and English, mm -hmm. especially like mainly to, to kind of, I don't know, decentralize from English. Um, when you first moved back to Taiwan after being in England for so long, mm -hmm. did you in a way feel like you were a foreigner? Yeah. Kind of yeah, very much so. Um, I think it was troubling me for so long. I even started like, I was trying to do a publication, like to talk about all of this. But it's quite hard to talk about it 
when I think about Taiwan or my time in Taiwan or how I see myself, how people perceive me in Taiwan, like I get stressed, like I get stressed. I used to get like crazy dreams. So you were asking, was I fitting or not fitting in Taiwan? And I guess the short answer is, to be honest, it gave me, like, it was a bit of a nightmare. How did you think people perceived you there? Like, why did it make you so nervous about There's a lot of small story and it ended up becoming... Um, like rumors or... That too, of course, standard, standard Asian. <laughs> um, I think I didn't know because I think biggest conflict is when I went back to Taiwan, I was going through my own journey of I have just lost a life. Uh, I just lost the life I built up in London and it wasn't like uh, being in London seriously is not easy. And I remember when I first got back there, I was trying so hard to be part of it that I would buy all the magazines in art, in fashion, like even science magazine, just to remember names when I go out. I would like study what's going on here, like, like study and go to places and remembering faces just so that I'm, I can get into this. Um, it was so much socializing, so much reading, but not in school, you know, but more of about the society. I want to run with it. I want to like work with this city and see what could come out of it. Anyway, so when I went back to Taiwan, the biggest conflict is I'm in a position digesting some like quite a shocking thing that I was going through. So I was trying to overcome this thing that is just very shocking and traumatizing, depressing, you can choose whichever words you think fitting to a point that there were time I thought I didn't want to live this life, I want to fast forward. It's like I don't have patience for me this life now, I want to go to when I'm 50 and see what is this all gonna go because it feel like might as well not be my life, like who am I, you know? While that was going on, the society, I learned this much later, the society sees me as a very, very lucky girl who get to have all this freedom, have all this opinion, have all these experiences, being supported by their parents and not being restricted in any way. And I think that is something that really um, make people uncomfortable. Um, uncomfortable in a way that not only like, I don't think I found anyone to relate to, but I'm comfortable in a way that someone say to me, it's like home, home, in, in Taiwan. It's like, like if you're in a society where people have to behave certain way or put through certain repression in order to progress a little bit or, or just even to survive, um, yeah, you don't just go around and slap them on the face and just like kind of being very like outrageously free, I guess. But then in my head, I didn't see myself being free at the time. In my head, I see that I had a big thing taken away from me. And I don't know who I was. Everything I built is like gone. So. I think that is the big clash and it's just, I guess it was impossible for me to be easygoing. 